this is a response to conference report. Um, interesting uh, idea, the life half lived, and what is a life that's not lived to the full? Um, I give the example of Homer Simpson, where it was sort of implied that he was actually living life to the full by loafing on the couch, drinking beer, and eating salty, greasy snacks, mass-produced junk. Um, because that's what his thing is. That's Homer being Homer to the nth degree. That's what makes him an actualized being. That's what puts him in a state of pure being. It's the ironic sort of countertake on mass culture and consumerism. Maybe, for some people, this works. This edifice of modernity actually gives some people meaning. Now, we all know that the general gist of meaning means breaking free of something, means breaking free of the mundane and the, uh, the, um, the ordinary and the calm and the stable. <clears throat> you know, you go off and you join the French Foreign Legion and end up uh, with bullets whizzing past your head or you know, taking part in an impossible training regimen, and this gives your life meaning simply because finally I've got an endless series of obstacles to overcome, which is precisely what I need as a human being. I guess that's the opposite uh, of Homer Simpson. Um, you know, the Foreign Legion is the classic example of people who simply have to be uh, in the middle of an impossible situation as often as possible. Um, <clears throat> then there are people that are like that. So, you know, you have the phenomenon, as you say, of uh, uh, you only live once, uh, live life to the full, um, this sort of thing. Now, I wonder what the distinction would be, though, because if I'm sort of going to compare Homer Simpson to a, a French Foreign Legionnaire, uh, say, currently based in Afghanistan, uh, fighting with the Taliban, um, I think French soldiers are still in Afghanistan, although I don't know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and say that they're more or less variations on the same theme. What would somebody who is not living life to the full look like? Well, I, I would say that you can't really tell. You can't tell whether or not somebody is actually living life to the full. Um, but there are plenty of literary examples of this, and my favorite one is uh, uh, The Lord of the Rings where you sort of see there's, I think, three major groups of people who are alive but not alive, and they're dead but they're not dead, or not really groups, but there's... Uh, the biggest example of this, I suppose, is either Sauron himself or um, Gollum. Both of them are sort of... They, they've poured their being into something exterior to themselves in the case of the ring. Um, and in certain ways, there is overlap between Saul, uh, Gollum and Sauron. They are kind of, in some ways, sharing a personality through the ring. They're both alive, but they're not alive. Uh, they're both dead, but they're not dead. Um, Gollum is sort of... He only lives to possess the ring again, even though he hates the ring, and the ring tortures him. Um, and... Sauron only exists as an eye that's out there looking at everything outside of himself, and he doesn't see anything within. The eye is this ray that only goes out and sees everything in, in the universe, in the phenomenal material universe, and <clears throat> he can't really see himself. He is sort of only existing for things that are outside of himself. He's gone into a state of complete non-being, and when I think it's... <clears throat> Uh, either Mary or Pippin stares into the palantir, into that round orb that they get from Saruman. Uh, it's explained into, in, 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 sorry, in the book, that he's, he's staring into a window into nothing. In other words, um, Sauron has gone about as far from pure being as it's possible to be. He is not quite dead, but he's definitely not alive. He's alive in, in a state of non-being. Uh, the other two groups that you see are the the oath breakers that come out in the last uh, the last um, episode, the Return of the King, that help fight the Battle of Middle Earth in front of uh, uh, the gates of Mordor, and uh, of course there's uh, also the Nine Ring Wraiths, who are sort of minor versions of uh, 
of Sauron who have simply forgotten their own identities. It's even mentioned that the mouth of Sauron, who comes out to parley with them as the armies of the free peoples are ready to storm into Mordor, he's actually forgotten his own name. He, uh, he, 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 his state of being is almost gone, but he's not dead because you can see him sitting up there on his horse. The other ring wraiths are like this. They're sitting on their horses. They sort of exist and don't exist temporarily. They exist in our world and they also exist in some half world of semi-existence. Now that's, I guess, what you would call a life half-lived. It's almost a state that's uh, worse than either life or death. Um, it's neither one. You, you can't really enjoy the things of this world. Uh, you notice that Gollum only likes revolting food. Um, and uh, but you can't really and, and Sauron doesn't even have a physical body and neither do the Oathbreakers but you can't enjoy the things of the other world because you're not dead yet or you know assuming there is another world the world of the spirit or whatever you're suspended between the two which is you know at least in terms of the overall mythos of Middle Earth the worst possible way to exist it's the worst of both worlds <clears throat> now the counterpart to that to a life half-lived, or a life sort of artificially lived, uh, well, there's several suggestions as to who that might be. Some people have said it's the elves, because the elves only exist essentially up in their own heads. They, the, the outside world interests them less and less, and uh, towards the period of it, to, that uh, covers the Lord of the Rings, I just, um, they're almost, have completely lost interest in anything that happens in Middle Earth. Um, so they're kind of seen as a little bit too effete and a little bit too too much up in the head. Uh, to me, it's always been that the hobbits were seen as the perfect example of how to live. Um, they are not interested in the big issues of wealth and power and, and this sort of thing. They like the immediate things. They like uh, food. They like uh, playing with their children. They like big parties. They like fellowship. Uh, they like uh, relaxing, laying on the grass, staring up at the sky while chewing on a weed. Um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, just what we would consider pure, healthy um, pursuits. And neither extremes of, of the spirit or of the flesh are particularly interesting to them. They are existing in a state of being. They are in, in, a, in a state of sort of completeness, even though they are, on the face of it, um, of very little worth in terms of Middle Earth as a whole. Now, of course, that's done by Tolkien de deliberately as some sort of a uh, some sort of a paradox. Is that these silly little hobbits are actually the ones that ha are the most powerful and greatest of them all? Uh, they no, they don't wear crowns. They they don't have kings. They don't they're not interested in anything, and they want to sit around telling stories, laughing, and you know, twiddling their toes while you know just being together. That's it. That's as far as their own uh, existence goes. Because they're quite content with things as they are. Things both exterior and up here. They are emotionally, it is assumed, extremely healthy people. So, <clears throat> we have being and non-being, and that's the Lord of the Rings version. I would say that that business of non-being is, is a very uh, potent metaphor throughout our, uh, our literature. Uh, you know, you go all the way back to, say, Dante, where the denizens of his hell in the Inferno, uh, <laughs> they're in hell, but they're very much not dead. Like, things continue to happen to them. Uh, they haven't reached a state of eternal peace, um, uh, but, you know, they, they still are down there in hell doing things, eating and having sex and fighting and killing each other and uh, experiencing pain and horror and suffering and everything, so they're not in a, in 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 a sense they're not really dead at all. They're um, they're not alive because they're in the, the inferno. They're stuck in there for all eternity, so they're not in the in phenomenal reality the way that say even as Dante and Virgil go down there, they're sort of um, well. I, I suppose at least Dante is still a human being because he has the capacity to leave hell afterwards. Um, and go up to Purgatory and uh, the Paradiso. So <clears throat> he got to he got to see what it was like to be in a state of non-being, where you are neither alive nor dead. 
Now, we have plenty of examples, I suppose, of this in daily life, but I, you know, again, we tend to sort of like to caution each other, or I like to caution people. What is a dead human being? What, what, what does that person look like? How would we spot such a person? I would say that, that we can't really spot such a person. We don't know whether or not somebody is actually getting, is actually wasting their life, or is actually getting the most in terms of value out of it. I have a, um, a disturbing question that I put to some of my coworkers where, where I work. Like in, in my office, you can sort of like we're up on the seventh floor, and you can look out and, and down onto the onto a back street behind my building, and you see a lot of marginal people, shall we say, who spend their time uh, loafing in alleyways, drinking various non-potables sometimes. Sometimes they're drinking actually booze that is meant to be drank. Um, in a various states of human decay. And I ask, we're, we're used to sort of saying, look, th these are failures of life. And I say, how do we know that those people aren't exactly where we, where they want to be? Now, I suspect that they probably aren't where they want to be. It's it's pretty hard to, exa to imagine that as a good, a good existence. But at the end of the day, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I have no way of getting into their their head, their life, their their experience, and judging what they get out of it all. Uh, this has the added interest, the added sort of spin, over the fact that a lot of the people that you see, it's one of the skeletons in Canada's closet, and it's a massive one, are Aboriginal Canadians, um, where they sort of end up in the city. They were born and raised on reserves. They end up in the city, and they, they don't have any of the normal... Um, or they don't appear to have any of the normal sort of social skills that are incumbent upon being raised in the city or in a larger society, or our larger society, I should say. They have plenty of skills for existing in their own society, but not in our society. So you have cases where um, people, they, they do things that don't seem to make sense to us. Um, but it's simply that they do things that we don't understand. It makes perfect sense to them to do these things, or they wouldn't be doing them. For example, sitting in broad daylight in a bus shelter, uh, talking to people, talking to other people like them, and drinking a, out of a bag that's in a bottle, or a bottle that's in a bag. Um, now, to a non-native Canadian, that's about as disgraceful as conduct gets, but they'll do this. You will see this going on. Uh, at times uh, where it's quite apparent that they're not terribly interested in what anyone thinks about this. Now, at, at that point where I think that that is <clears throat> probably the most offensive to non-natives thing that they can do, and it's not the overt act of sitting there drinking uh, in a bus shelter when everyone else is standing around just staring at them and they don't seem to care. It's their indifference to all of this. It's their saying, this gigantic edifice of your civilization means nothing to us. That's, I think, whether or not they actually feel that, that's what people take that as. It's a vast repudiation of our culture. So, rather than sort of say these people are the ultimate failures of our society, maybe their sense of self-actualization is something that exists on a completely different level and we can't see it. This, what we think is a profound apathy to everything that we've created, uh, the skyscrapers, the, the computers, uh, the technology, the medi medical stuff, all this kind of thing that we have created. Uh, it's not that they're indifferent to it, or they're, sorry, it's not that they're apathetic to it, it's just that they're kind of indifferent to it all. Um, and yeah, that's one thing that you can't force people to do. You can't force people to value things when they when their values are that radically different from your own. So, okay, I understand the concept that um, being half dead or half in existence is a, apparently a valid one. Um, but whether or not you can actually spot that in somebody else is quite another matter entirely, which is why I'm sort of discussing these things in the context of existentialism, because existentialism is something that, you know, as usual, I'm going to point here, that's where existentialism takes place. I can't existentially uh, look at somebody else. <clears throat> but it does seem to me that this business of uh, half-existence or uh, a life half-lived or a half-lived life does have some uh, great truth behind it. And I think that we all have sort of periods in which 
we can look at ourselves with the benefit of hindsight and say, yeah, I was more or less dead at that time. And let's face it, there are people out there that, that we're going to sort of get the distinct feeling that these people are dead. Um, I'll, in spite of my ramblings to the contrary, I generally look at a, a alcoholic street person as someone who is neither alive nor dead, you know, but again, I have to tell myself and caution myself at the end of the day, I don't know. Thanks for the response.